in this world that we're all in right now of habitat improvement. We came out of deer season, we're focused on improving the habitat, we're, we're focused on improving, uh, taking, looking back at our notes, improving our hunting uh, skill, and we're also focused on the habitat improvements that are every, ever so popular in the whitetail woods all over the whitetail range um, this time of the year. So March is a very big month. So that kind of proves that it's this is the go time. But with that said, there's always going to be pros and cons. There's always going to be, no matter where you're at in the region, uh, in that whitetail range, you're always going to be uh, have things that work. You're going to have things that, that don't work. And you're always going to have, at the top of this world, you're always going to have folks that are have a YouTube channel that are from the north or from the south, and everybody has a... Uh, set in stone this is what you need to do if you don't do it this way it doesn't work well folks I'm here to tell you is that's not how this works you have to focus your habitat improvements around your region because you have three so three of the habitat improvements that fail during the month month of March are regional influenced so the biggest issue is that, that I see folks uh, failing at habitat improvements, no matter what month it is, but especially the month of March, is grasping a hold of those um, ever so popular, that free advice all over the country, such as this channel is, and we're reaching out and you're telling folks per region that you're in that that region that you're in is the gospel, that it should be, that should be... Um, that should be what it is across the entire nation. Well, like I said, that doesn't work. You have to be able to know different regions, and by only the only way that you're going to know different regions is actually traveling to, such as I do, designing properties in those areas, have lived in those areas, um, have hunted in those areas. You know, have been out west, have been to you know out east. Um, you know, and and really take those into consideration about what works in those regions and what don'ts. What doesn't so uh, three things that we're going to talk about three three March habitat fails that are all regionally influenced so so number one and this is one right off the bat that gets people pretty on fire so no no pun intended but the uh, number one is controlled or prescribed burns the the theory of the prescribed and controlled burns are is is a great tool if you're in the right region. Now, because of the month, month of March here that we're, we're talking about, we're in the middle of March here, and down south where conditions aren't as extreme as they are, winter conditions aren't as extreme as they are here in the north, the Midwest, the north, the northeast, in your, your states such as uh, Georgia, Alabama, parts of Kentucky, you know, all of those states play into what can be tied to as a successful prescription. Now, so I'm going to use an example here. I'm often asked this, so, okay, if you don't if you don't recommend the prescribed burns in the Midwest and the North and the Northeast, then why do they work in the South and why do they don't work up here? Well, to me folks, it's no different than this. It's no different than going into the doctor and saying, "Hey, I want uh, X medication." and for my, my uh, stomach issue, and he's gonna say, well, why do you think that you need, or they're gonna say, why do you think that you need that, um, you know, that, uh, that prescription? And you're gonna say, well, because it worked for, you know, my cousin Joe that, that lives in Alaska. Well, they're gonna have to do some research and find out if that's your issue. So before they just prescribe you that same medication. One medication doesn't cure everybody. It's the same situation when you talk about the prescription or the prescribed burn that we hear. So in in uh, parts of the Missouri is a perfect example, Southern Illinois, uh, all the way you know in those southern parts of the Midwest, they can and down into the South. You're trying to regenerate. You're trying to take the thatch. You're trying to kill off the overburden, and you're you're regenerating um, that uh, leftover mass cover on the ground that serves no purpose and chokes stuff off, uh, regeneration off, and gives you that healthy, green, lush uh, understory. And it works. Here's the problem. In those areas, you're only dealing with 40 to 50 percent, maybe 60 percent in some of those areas, 
or where your your uh, daily intake of the white tails um, diet is woody brows. Well, when you transition from there up here to the, the, the Midwest, the northern part of the Midwest, into the north or the northeast, you know, this region that I'm in, for example, right here in mid-Michigan, you know, our levels are like 85 to 90 percent of a deer's intake is woody brows. Well, you can't reach that woody brows requirement if you continually kill it off with a prescribed burn. And, and so here's the truth, and here's the myth buster. In, in most folks' eyes, they see the burn as a way to, to really uh, regenerate all the forbs. Well, here's the deal is, in the south, when the snow load doesn't overtake and smash all that stuff, and they can't, uh, you know, they, they have a, a chance to reach that. So you prescribe burn in the south, it regenerates all those forbs and forages, and it, it becomes a food source pretty much the entire year, especially uh, you know right after you do it in the month of March, and then all of a sudden you see by the time turkey season hits, it's all green, and the turkeys love it. Well, turkey habitat and whitetail habitat are not the same. You know, there's other things that attach. There's other wildlife, uh, you know, other wildlife uh, out there that attaches to the whitetail habitat. Turkeys in the density that we're trying to create, not the turkeys that are taking advantage of our food plots, but you know the the, the density and the uh, browse requirements that we're trying to reach for white-tailed deer is not turkey habitat, and the reason is it's a predator trap for turkeys. It's not for it done right. It's not for white-tails, but it is a predator trap for the the turkey. The coyotes can use it. They get in thicker. The, the turkeys can't navigate through it. They can't fly out of it. Well, here, here, when you're trying to create the whitetail habitat portion of it, that's what you need to, to reach those requirements for the whitetail in the Midwest and the North and the Northeast. So, really think about that. What, what are you doing as far as the prescribed burn? Uh, I've got a good friend of mine, I'm not sure if he's watching this or not, but this is one of the things that we, we differ on, is he's from, uh, born and raised in, in Illinois, and they do prescribed burns down there. Well. Um, we used to do that at the lodge down in Pike County, and it, it, and it works. It's a great tool, but that portion of uh, southern Pike County, northern Calhoun County, all the way, uh, you know, from there south, all the way across the, the uh, you know, the river into parts of Missouri, that region right there is kind of the breaking point on does it work or does it not. But down there, after the burns, you'll see a lot of the clovers getting uh, put in uh, or sewed into that, uh, that ash and it becomes great turkey habitat but they do not have the snow load folks if it snows in southern illinois or even where i was at at the lodge in pike county if it snows sometimes uh you know there's certain parts of the of you know of a uh, over a five-year period that yes they'll get snow that sticks for a week or two but usually if it snows it's gone by noon that's the old joke that i used to say down there uh you know in kentucky perfect example I was down there uh, with a friend of mine and doing a couple projects uh, a couple months ago there, and you know the ice storm was going to hit, and they you know they shut schools down, they shut businesses down, and it was a you know a heck of an ice storm. But it's not the 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 harsh conditions for long term that we deal with in the uh, upper Midwest, the North and the Northeast. So really take that into consideration. Is your prescribed burn good for your region? And in the most cases, 90% of the cases, once you get north of that region, that is, is the uh, highlighted area where most of the, the, the doctors, if you will, prescribe that in that area, that's not the thing to do in Iowa. It's not the thing to do up, in, uh, you know, up here in uh, Michigan. It's not the thing to do um, in, uh, you know, in the Northeast over into New York. So you really have to take that into consideration. What are you feeding? When are you feeding it? Is the, prescri is the prescribed burn really what you need to do? Now, where does the prescribed or the controlled burn, the controlled part of this, become um, effective? So if you're in these regions up to the north and you have planted switchgrass in the past and it's at that seven and eight uh, year time period and it's losing its density, then it's not the prescribed burn at that point. Now we're looking at the, the term that connects to it as the controlled burn. 
because you want to look at that and all of it obviously has to be controlled but the controlled portion of it is more of the your, your grasslands your pasture and that does work you have to get rid of it now can you mow it uh, yes you could now can you uh, you know burn it in those areas but here's the deal you really have to know what you're doing I've seen I've personally seen um, things get really out of control with the controlled burns uh, right two miles uh, three miles from my house right here the controlled burn that was done by the state of Michigan a few years ago well guess what didn't stay controlled and it ended up not only burning the state property it went into the private properties and now all your private landowners suffered from it because all, all of their land is burnt as well so now all their browse is gone so that is a to me that's a fail that's a fail at a state level that affected private landowners and to me that because that was done out on the public grounds or the state grounds to me it made great uh, turkey habitat but it ruined the deer population that was three years ago I can drive you past there right now and you can shoot you know 200 yards through the uh, through the red pine stand that they did it in with it where it started before it took over a couple hundred acres of private ground so is it worth doing you have to know what you're doing are you in the right region and the uh, like I said the only way that I could connect that to the controlled part of it that works is the switchgrass getting your switchgrass down so you can plant new switchgrass after that uh, longevity and that density starts to fade away in the years uh, in the years past so that's my two cents on on the burning side of it look at that prescribed every time that you hear the, the word prescribed whether it's prescribed through the state for a uh, you know um, for your Forbes or your your wild your wildflower or they want to mix the prescribed prescription says to uh, add mixes to your switchgrass because that's what the state recommends you have to look at that as far as your region mixing anything into uh, you know as far as grasses mixing anything into your switchgrass in the northern region is a complete failure it, it doesn't work period there's no way around it it doesn't stand up to conditions it will crush and going into the prescribed burn part of it back to that uh, side of it is that will get you into trouble you are we're trying to build habitat now i highly recommend that if you are in an area where the state and most of the time they will notify the state of michigan does this um, <clears throat> that situation i've heard that some of them were notified some of them weren't uh, when there is going to be a prescribed burn if you're next to public ground or within a mile or two of the public ground i highly recommend uh, being taking the uh, precautions and being ready for that burn especially when they're when wh whatever side that they're burning it on uh, due to the wind whatever side that they're trying to push that into the wind if things go south and it gets out of control i would highly recommend being on standby because if you are if you are managing your timber for uh, white whitetail habitat not tsi and you are trying to reach your whitetail goals whitetail hunting goals through your property and that that uh prescription from a neighbor a private neighbor or the state such as this situation i was explaining gets out of control you need to be there you need to have your hoses uh, ready you need to have your line of defenses uh, carved in around that property so it doesn't destroy it because yes they can refund you but I'm going to tell you right now the amount of money that you're going to get refunded is is uh, minute is pennies 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 on the dollar and it's it's not going to replace your whitetail habitat it's going to set you back years so in this region now in the south would it be a bad thing well maybe not because a lot of those areas down there maybe need to be opened up and that that thatch needs to be uh you know get gone kind of thing uh so would it work down there maybe would it work up here absolutely not so the the second uh topic here is frost seeding we touched on that kind of leading into this but frost seeding is a very very powerful tool frost seeding is as powerful as hinge cutting it's as powerful as the controlled and prescribed burns frost seeding has its place but the frost seeding that i see that is failing is everybody wants to take advantage of our our region here in uh, any cold climates and yes you can you can frost seed down in the uh, south as well but up here where you know in the midwest the north and northeast uh, frost seeding is very powerful it works great i don't have any frost seeding i'm going to do this year because i'm focused on fall food frost seeding and fall food 
aren't aren't conjoined. You know, I often get asked, what is the connection then with frost seeding? How do you do it, and when when to do it, and what do you plant? Clover is one of your frost seeding um, is one of your frost seeding seeds to actually actually get in the ground to take and regenerate or replenish clover plots that were eaten down or destroyed clover your alfalfa mixes that were kind of overtaken last year during the uh, season that is where clover you know your frost seeding comes in where i see that the frost seeding fails is folks are going right out onto their what their what was their fall food plots from last year now sowing them into your clovers and your alfalfas and frost seeding that on there and what's happening is is they're letting that grow because you're trying to feed the turkeys and you're going that out now if you just have a boatload of money that you you don't you know care to watch your dollars then i guess frost seed your food plots and feed the turkeys and then and then till it under because where i'm going with this is that's the majority of what happens it gets tilled under uh, clover your alfalfas are not meant to be tilled under that's why in the fall i do not plant clovers because i don't use mixes that have clovers in them I don't enhance that clover as the reason is unless it's a clover plot and it's going to be a clover plot for four or five years. That is, it's a very expensive seed. Um, it's relatively easy to plant. It's a little harder to maintain, but it has, it's like switchgrass. It lasts for a long time, uh, you know, well maintained because you can, can just do this. You can frost seed it and you can add to it. So frost seeding has its purpose, but you watch per region and watch what you're doing as far as what you're trying to control. Is your region that one of the regions in the deer range that has low deer numbers that you need summer food? Or should you be planting, should you be frost seeding uh, that area at all? And are you going to just till it under? Because the, the, the longevity of clover is why it's a perennial, not an annual. So I see a lot of money being wasted on, on farms uh, being planted to this and uh, it, it's a waste of money. It's, it's not, you're not, if you're tilling it, if you're frost seeding it and then you're going to till it in uh, midsummer, late summer, you're wasting your money. You're not getting the value that the clover was meant to, to be in, in, you know, as far as a fall forage uh, deer food. So take that one uh, kind of into consideration when you're, when you're looking at frost seeding here in the month of March. Are, is, does your region hold that? Does frost seeding going to work? Are you far enough north where the frost actually is heaving and opening up the pores in the ground and is going to set that in? Are you, fur, you know, are you further south where you don't, you're not getting those conditions? So is frost seeding really as powerful as you've been told by you know someone that's in uh, in the if you're down south watching this in the southern states and you know somebody from the north is telling you you need to frost seed? Do you have the conditions to frost seed? So. One of those things, all in, all regionally influenced. And a third thing that we're going to touch on today here, guys, is something that I love. I I love mulching, and I have a uh, uh, Sean uh, Degenhart through uh, Black Sheep Outdoors is doing a lot of my mulching for me now. I have a couple other connections around the uh, country, but Sean, we uh, connected last year, and uh, he's he just does a great great job. He's got the equipment, he's got the knowledge, and he follows the uh, designed. Uh, you know, he follows the designed uh, layouts of the of the, the properties, and he kind of can read that terrain, read the contour. He knows when to get in there to do the mulching and, and when not to, as far as your your if, if he needs to get out on like tag elder uh, or wetland areas. Uh, he knows he's not going to get in trouble, and, and you know, uh, you know, do the best for you. What what that brings up is this, and even with Sean, and even the the uh, uh, even the uh, clients around the uh, country. I always recommend this. I recommend this in my handbooks. I recommend this at my meetings, at my analysis packages on the ground. Is this is a very, very powerful tool. I was just on a property this weekend here in Osceola County, Michigan. That's exactly this. Is if you were to do that by hand, and they've got a lot of popple, uh, you know, that's over silver dollar size. That's creeping up on an inch, uh, inch and a half, uh, two inches that needs to be controlled, and we're cutting those transitions in. We're making those uh, buck corridors out to those secluded buck bedding areas. And if you were to do that by hand, you have all that debris and it's going to take uh, weeks, maybe months to, to accomplish it. That's where mulching comes in. But the fail that I see that's attached to mulching is the debris that is left on the, for that ground cover is left so thick that uh, you, cannot, you cannot regenerate 
your green brayer, your any any of your brayers, your blackberry, all of your uh, new popple regeneration, any hardwood that would pick up and come in there, the cherry, any of that stuff that you're hoping to define that line of movement and that edge through those transition areas because like in this situation, if we're mulching, obviously your, your canopy is lower, so you might be dealing with, you know, six, seven, eight foot trees, 10 foot trees, whatever the case is, you know, depending on hardwood and, and uh, softwood, whatever that is. But if you're opening that up and you have all of that mass, uh, uh, all that mass debris laying on the ground, you need to make sure that you are uh, working with someone such as Sean, or there's, you know, there's a couple other ones here in Michigan, they're all over the country now, and it's a very powerful tool, very expensive tool to have. So, you know, a lot, a lot of folks have them, but uh, what I found is the, the right people in most cases have them. They know how to run them, they know how to stay safe. Um, and that ground cover thing is just something that I see a lot of. We're leaving too much mulch on the uh, ground in those transition areas, or if you're cutting in uh, even access trails. Now on your property line, if you're cutting them in, obviously you're not worried about that other than, you know, you wanna be able to, you know, you can drive over it and not be puncturing tires. Uh, but as far as your deer transition areas where you're poking you know, trails through tag elder, or you're poking uh, holes through these, uh, you know, these, like this property I was telling you about here with the popple. Uh, we just want to make sure that when they, they just, it's not just a forward motion just as fast as they can go and leaving that debris all piled up. Because if you take, you know, your stem count doesn't have to be uh, very, uh, very high in when you're dealing with larger trees to, to create a lot of that biomass that you're putting on the ground. And if it's too thick, all that regeneration is not going to come back up in there and you lose your, what I call, re referred to as my movable f uh, feed, my movable food to my clients, is that's that feed that the deer are eating as they're transitioning through those transition areas from bed to feed. And you want that, you want that regeneration. You have to have that browse, that ever so um, important browse uh, in those transition areas, which we, we spoke of up here in the first about the burn, is, is you know, you, we, we need that stem count. We need that browse. And by not having that, uh, that, uh, that mulch layer, if you will, on the ground now and not having it opened up enough so that can take place, you're really taking away the value of not only the transition itself, but the food value along the way of the, in the transition. So how you cure that is they, they really just make sure now if you're in rocky ground, they're going to kind of, you know, maybe do some things different. Maybe they do have to push some of it off or whatever. But in most cases, they can not only just go forward, it's a back and forth motion, motion and they're really grinding it, that up into that top layer of, of that, uh, you know, that uh, uh, topsoil that's already there or some organic matter, some mounds and stuff that they're leveling out. You just want to make sure that you touch on with anybody that's going to come in and do your mulching, whether it's a transition area or, or uh, you know, in your food plots or anything like that. You really want to make sure that that stuff is ground down far enough, especially in your food plots, that's a good point to touch on. Um, you don't want that debris all left in uh, a really, really thick, dense layer. You have to be able to make sure that that is mixed. And then that, if it does have enough air to it and have the air soil mix as well, then it's very powerful. And the reason for that is, is it's organic matter and that bark will rot down it becomes uh, like popple, for example, really rots and it re it's releasing all that natural fertilizer that that rotting decay uh, creates. So it's a very powerful tool, but it can get too thick. So here are the uh, pros and the cons of, uh, of three major topics that I see that go on during the month of March. So I encourage you to kind of to look at these if, if you're in, no matter what region that you're in in the, in the nation, does the prescribed burn uh, you know, is that really what you're sh what you should be doing? Who is the one that prescribed it? Who is the doctor that prescribed the that burn in your area? Where is he from? How can he relate that to northern climates versus southern climates? Something that's uh, very very important to study. Second thing, the frost seeding. If you are listening, if you're in the south, you're listening from someone that's the doctor prescribing this from the north. Do you have the conditions to really take advantage of frost seeding? And are you planting clover and just going to till it in? Uh, and then the last one that we just spoke of is the mulching. Just make sure that that's ground up enough to let that, uh, you know, you get that soil uh, mixed in with your air and uh, the soil and the debris and it's not too thick so you can get that regeneration and on your food plots so you can, uh, you're not choking off all your regrowth 
uh, that we need to make those uh, food plots ever so uh, important and uh, powerful going into the fall.